first Chinese dynasty or two. We do not know if these dynasties actually existed. But eventually we come to a dynasty that did exist, the Qin dynasty. Now, again, anyone who knows Chinese knows it in English just does not look like Qin. But this is a way that I understand they pronounce it. If any of you know any differently, your input is welcome. I have had more than one Chinese student correct me when I pronounce some of these names. But I understand this is the Qin. And um, anyway, the Qin Dynasty lasted for several generations and uh, really got China started. A king from the, now folks, this has got a hot issue right here. A Chinese emperor, they always called their king emperor. The Chinese emperor from the Qin Dynasty built the Great Wall of China. This business of building a wall is, of course, right now a hot issue, and I really don't want to discuss it unless somebody really wants to. But I will say this. The wall was built to keep the Mongolians out, the uncivilized Mongolians. Now, if you find that offensive, I want to tell you about another wall. The Roman Emperor Hadrian built a wall across the British Isles to keep my own uncivilized Scottish ancestors from coming in and stealing from the British. The British were civilized, the Scots people weren't. I'm, I'm a Scottish descent, so uh, anyway. Uh, to keep my own ancestors from coming in and stealing. But what these Mongolians would do, oh yeah, there was another wall built in England also called Office Wall. It was designed to keep the uncivilized Welsh people from going in and stealing from the more civilized English. Uh, these people felt like they had to separate themselves from the uncivilized folk who lived close enough to steal. Now, in the case of the Mongolians, they would sneak in, steal everything they could, including children and wives and whatever, and, uh, make, and take them away to Mongolia and make slaves of them. Now, I had a student several years ago write a paper saying that what the Chinese should have done, rather than spending all that money on a wall, was to have spent that money instead on an army. He'd be right if it was a year, if, they had, if they'd have had airplanes and cell phones, and two-way radios, and satellite technology. That would have been a great idea. But keep in mind that Chinese had none of this, and that Mongolians had a knack for knowing where the Chinese army was, so they'd sneak in where the Chinese army wasn't, and be gone before the Chinese army could catch them. The Chinese tried to negotiate. They'd come in and try to buy back what the Mongolians had stolen, and try to negotiate with the Mongolians. In some cases, they'd come in and wipe out an entire Mongolian village, but uh, that was not always effective because there were too many of them. But they built the wall to keep the Mongolians out. And uh, we'll later talk about a Mongolian who managed to breach the wall and conquer much of China. But uh, that, was, that was to come later. But for the most part, the, it was effective to keep these people from coming in and stealing their stuff. In the modern world, a lot of folk highly frown on this idea. Again, though, all right, there's two sides. We're going to talk in a few minutes about a man who said that what is practical should supersede what is philosophical, what is ideal. There's the ideal and there's a the practical. The man's name was Confucius. Confucius believed in the, doing the practical without regard for the ideal. Great Wall, again built by a king in the Qin Dynasty. Now, folk, the Great Wall was built but during the reign of one king. I have a hard time believing that, but nevertheless, that's what the history books tell us. And maybe, maybe I should have, after what I said about the pyramids, maybe I should believe it. Someone bought this morning, can a Great Wall be seen from the moon? It probably could be if it were as wide as it is long. It isn't, so it can't be seen. But it can be seen by astronauts going around the Earth in low orbit. Um, along with some of our wider superhighways, they can be seen. Um, again, Great Wall of China, one of the wonders of the medieval world. Now, which brings us to the Han Dynasty. Han Dynasty lasted some 400 years, and we will talk again about the Han Dynasty when we come to Chapter 5 on Rome. The Han Dynasty 
was from about 200 BCE to 200 CE, a period of 400 years. They extend, ex they, well, the Chinese look back on this time as being a classical time, a time of uh, greatness. There are two dynasties that stand out among the Chinese for greatness, the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty that came uh, in the 11 and 1200s or so. Uh, these are somewhat outstanding Chinese dynasties. So. But anyway, the Han. Now, I want to, there was an interruption in the Han period. In the middle of the Han Dynasty, there was one person who took over, destroyed part of the Han Dynasty, lasted about 15 or 16 years, and then when he died, when he died, the Han Dynasty was restored. Wang Mang, now the reason I'm emphasizing him, I mean if you look him up on Wikipedia, it just got page after page after page of him. No, I'm not going into that depth, but there are a couple things I want you to know about him. He was a socialist. Now he was somewhat related to the Han Dynasty. Actually, his father was a either brother or first cousin to the Han, one of the Han emperors. But nevertheless, when he was growing up, he was not as closely related as the others, so he grew up feeling like he was in poverty. Now, to the ordinary Chinese, I mean he was a member of the aristocracy, upper upper class, but to him, every one of the upper upper class dressed better than he did, had more money than he did, and uh, he felt inferior. When he got to be emperor, he thought, I'm going to alleviate poverty, and here's his big mistake, I'm going to restore the past. And he recalled a past age in China when everybody was equal, and no one was richer than anybody else. And folk, it looks like farther back you go that this was actually the case. Read again what, uh, we, we, uh, read that link and you'll find that uh, both Mohenjo Dao and, uh, and Harappa, it looks like everybody was equal. They had no palaces, uh, no priests it seems like. He wanted to restore that. Now, I have asked you in a syllabus to be looking for this. This man took land from the rich that the rich didn't need. He said, all you rich have too much land. I'm going to take all the land from you you don't need. And I'm going to give this land to the poor people. This has been tried several times. The Chinese didn't learn their lesson. They tried it later. South of the border of Mexico, the Mexican president tried it once. The Koreans have tried it. I don't know how many more people have tried it. To some extent, my other Soviet Union tried it. Yes. That is an extremely good question. I think I know the answer, though. All right, folks, I'm going to get a little personal. I grew up in poverty. My dear dad is not here to defend himself, but I have long believed that his poverty was because of his own bad judgments. It wasn't because of the super crummy American system which was not super funny. It was the best in the world. His own bad judgments. Now, hey, now, that's for that answer. I hope I've already answered your question. You give a super poor person a bunch of wealth, and in short order, it's going to be gone. They don't know how to manage it. Take land from the rich, give the poor in short order, your poor people are going to lose the land. Again, to the rich who that's maybe the same rich people. Uh, in Rome, all right, the Romans, two brothers to the Gracchus brothers were going to do the same thing. Take lands from the rich and give to the poor. Didn't work. Now, the Jews had a system where that every 50 years, all land returned to its original owner. And a lot of experts said this was the best system that ever was. Because a family might fall into poverty accidentally. But every 50 year they might say, well, didn't the person who got the land back lose it? Maybe so, but maybe their sons could manage it. After 50 years later, maybe the land would go to this one's son or grandson, and 
maybe they could manage it, but all land. So you, when you bought land, you bought land based on how many years is it until the Jubilee? If it, were, if it were 49 years of Jubilee, then you had to pay a pretty big price for land. If you're only 10 years till Jubilee, you paid much less for the land when you, if someone had to sell it. They'd sell it for a lesser price. So they, anyway, the way we handle this problem here in this country is we put a high tax on land that you're not using. And anybody, I mean, if you buy a house, make sure you go to the courthouse and get what's called a homestead exemption. That way your property taxes will be down here. If you don't get the exemption, or if the house is not being lived in, the government's going to charge a tax up here. If you're a farmer, or none of us probably, you probably will be, but farmers must get a farmer exemption for the land that they own, because if they own a bunch of land they're not using, and the government finds out, and the government does come around and look, believe me. One of my brothers is a farmer, bought a plot of land one time, and he thought, I'll improve it. So the first year, it was unimproved. Second year, he put some nice new fencing, had a man dig five water holes, put a barn with a concrete floor and a metal barn. The government saw it. Next year, his property tax. They said it looked at a metal barn, five ponds, fenced property, had several head of cattle. All right, anyway, so we managed to keep certain, I mean, we managed to keep the land from falling into the hands of a few that way by taxing land that a person is not using. But anyway, um, this man wound up leading to rebellion, trying to make everybody equal, trying to restore what he thought was the old days. And finally a bunch of Chinese rose up, killed him. He had already killed his son who was rebelling, had rebelled against him. So he had no son succeed him and they restored the old Mang the old Han Dynasty. But his dynasty only lasted a few years, and then the Han Dynasty was restored after him. He lived from about 8 CE to about uh, 19 CE, something like that. Don't write those dates down, but they're, they're close. Just, uh, he, was only made, he, he only ruled for a few years. But I found him fascinating, so that's why and I, I thought I'd mention it. All right. As far as we know, folks, as far as I know, this is the first attempt by a government to help the poor with government money. And one of the questions I ask is what happens when the government gets involved in helping the poor? The result is almost always disastrous. Now, I say this, I'm not saying it's tongue in cheek. There was a poll conducted just last week that more than 30% of Americans believe in socialism. Oh, if I'm going off. 30%? More than 30%. More than that. The numbers in the 30s. Believe in socialism. Check out Venezuela. And also, let me ask any of you, where in the world has socialism actually worked? Nazi Germany? Communist Russia? Communist China? <coughs> I'll tell you a story about both Russia and China. They killed 25 million people. Not by famine, I mean by famine, oh yeah, but it wasn't a famine caused by shortages. During the year that 25 million Russian peasants died, the farming was excellent that year. The weather was cooperative. The farmers had a big harvest. The farmers were, now turn in all your produce to the state and we will redistribute it evenly to everybody. And 25 million people did not get anything distributed to. Perish from hunger. China, the exact same thing happened in the 1950s when I was young, much younger than all of you are now. Some 20 million people died of starvation at a time of good harvest. This is socialism for you. Um, the British thought they tried it after they whipped the socialist Germany and the socialist Italy. They said, but we can make it work. This Germany and Italy socialism didn't work because they had evil men running. And Russia's not, because it's not got an evil man. So that Britain picked the most, three of the most morally upright men who've ever ran a government. And Lord Acton was one of them. And they were morally upright. They didn't get it to work. After a while, Margaret Thatcher came in and said, we've got to reverse this. This doesn't work. Um, France has tried socialism. It has failed. 
by any reasonable count had failed. All right. Anyway, this was a, like a first attempt at socialism that I know of. If I researched it further, I might come up with more. All right, before I get into Chinese religion, there is another concept that I want to introduce to you, the yin and the yang. Now, the sun and the moon. They believed the sun and the moon were opposites. Now, they believed that everything would be in balance if you got your yin and yang in harmony, including the human body. Now, you might go to a doctor today, and the doctor would say, I'm feeling bad, what's wrong with me? And the doctor would oh, you're low on iodine. Then the doctor will give you, will prescribe you some iodine pills. And if he was right on his diagnosis, once you start taking the iodine, you'll feel better because your body's chemistry has been restored. But their chemistry was much simpler, just two things. But they believed that again, if you kept the yin and yang in balance, you'd be happy. But if one of them got out of balance with the other, one of them got above the other, one of them got below the other, you'd be sick. Um, again, to me, this is an oversimplification, but one place, two places to know where the there are opposites, real opposites, electricity and magnetism. Electricity consists of a positive and a negative. You must have both. I put a radio together one time and hooked it up, tried it out, nothing happened. I got my voltmeter out and found that everywhere it went, it was 12 volts, 12, even on the chassis, 12 volts. And I realized, oops, I'd only connected the positive side and had not connected the negative side. Once I connected the negative side, the, everything worked. Tried that once in my car. One of my terminals on my battery was not connected. All of you know the result. Try connecting just one terminal on your car battery and turning on the engine and nothing will happen. Magnetism, you have a north and a south. Now in the case of both electricity and magnetism, if you take a magnet and put the north pole to the north pole, the magnets are repelled. So let me know that. When you put the north pole to the south pole, they'll grab each other. Put the south to north, they'll grab each other. Put north to north, they don't like each other. Like ends repel, opposite ends attract. Again, that's similar to the yin and yang concept. Two opposites that have to work together in order to have any kind of harmony. And again, electricity, you might have noticed your wall plug-ins. Of course, today they have three. One of them is just a ground, but the other two are live wires. Ground is for your protection. All right. Well, yeah, don't ask which one's the positive and which one's the negative. The, these wall outlets are alternating current that change direction every six, 60 times every second, 60 cycle. But you may notice on all plug ins, one of them is bigger than the other. There is a reason. I'm not going into that right now. All right. Um, yin and yang. All right. This takes us up to the Chinese philosophy. Before I start, Confucius is like so many of your founders. <clears throat> he was not popular while he was alive. He was not honored while he was alive. He was not honored until after he was gone. In our own history, the man who some of us call the greatest president we had, Abraham Lincoln, was called an imbecile, an idiot, and all kinds of bad names while he was alive. And after he died, they could not honor him highly enough. Confucius, somewhat the same way, Confucius was a philosopher who wanted to get some rich person to sponsor him. This was a way that artists and musicians and philosophers made their money in those days. I mean, today they try to get an audience and get the audience to pay to hear them perform. But in those days, they would try to get a rich sponsor. If they could find a sponsor, well, Confucius lived out his life without ever finding a sponsor. And he died not very famous, but after he died, he became extremely famous. Now. Um, 
what is he credited with? Mainly, among other things, he's credited with emphasizing the practical. Never mind now, there's two sides to a lot of issues. There's the practical and there's the philosophical. And I've already mentioned one case we have going on right at this minute. You have in Latin America a whole lot of turmoil and a lot of chaos, and some people want to seek refuge in the United States, and the issue, well, should we let them in? I mean, these people are in turmoil down there. Should we let them in this big, peaceful, rich country? Um, some people say yes, and some no. I'm not going to take a side on the issue right now. The practical thing to do is to not let them in. But the philosophical, humanitarian thing to do is to let them in. Now, which side is going to win? Practical. Now, I say, why do I say the practical is not the man? Because we cannot feed them, we cannot house them, we cannot clothe all of them we want to come in. And some of them like to commit crimes. So if you disagree with that, I mean, go ahead. But a lot of them want to commit crimes. Uh, the philosophical is, oh, we're for everybody, we're a land of everybody, let's build bridges and not walls. Let's just let everybody come in. Sweden has done that. So that everybody in here wants in. Sweden has become the rape capital of the world. And it's not the Swedish men either. It's these foreigners they've allowed in. They do not assimilate. Uh, these foreigners, they do not assimilate. All right, anyway, that's, that's one issue. Confucius would probably say, let it keep them out because it's the practical thing to do. Um, but again, Confucius is not around to take a side, but he emphasized the practical. He believed that if your actions and your mind were in harmony with the universe, you would be prosperous and you'd be happy. But you had to find out which, basically you had to find out which way the winds were blowing and drift along with the wind. Whether it be political winds or religious winds, Figure out which way the wind is blowing. So it's a kind of personal note. I can't agree with him less. I mean, I have to disagree with that. Anyway, you have to use that. Yeah, yeah, just go with the flow. Go with the flow. Yeah, that basically just, whichever way the river is flowing, go with the flow and drift with the flow, and you'll be happy. Um, now, there's something that he said that Thomas Jefferson liked. He said that government rules by the consent of the governed. Of the people. Alright, before this time, the Chinese believed that government ruled by the consent of heaven, or their word for heaven was Tian. Um, in other words, heaven set up the emperor, and when heaven was through with the emperor, the heaven put him down. Heaven determined when we were born and how long we lived and determined our destiny, determined what class we got in, what social class. All these were decided by heaven. Confucius said, no, we humans make our own decisions about these things. It's up to us to take charge of our own life. Now, <clears throat> like Buddha, we do not know if Confucius believed that and even believed that there's a God. Um, and something else too, if you haven't picked it up already, the Chinese concept of the spirit world was a nameless bunch of deities or spirits who resided in a place called Tian, and they were nameless. They, don't, they did not have a concept of a personal God who had a name and who they just if you prayed when you, if you did it all to the general cosmos, you might say, or to the general will of all the gods who determined what was going on in their assemblies. Nameless, faceless, with no characteristics about them. Heaven determined this, heaven determined that, without the concept of a personal god. Uh, this makes them somewhat unique because the other peoples of the world would name their gods and assign characteristics and behaviors to their gods. The Chinese tended not to. Um, but now, Confucius also believed that everybody had his own, you know, everybody had his own way. And if you found your own way, 
That was okay. So you did not have to live like your neighbor lived. Now, this sounds like it somewhat contradicts, and yes, all these people, if you look close, you'll find contradictions. I just told you that he said go with a flow, but then he said for each individual, let each individual determine his own flow. And this, in this regard, he somewhat contradicted himself. Uh, now, keep this word in mind, because in a few minutes I'm going to get back to it. The word da is loosely translated way. So if one person is quiet and reserved, that's his dog. Another person is outgoing and loud-spoken. Uh, that's, that's their dog to each his own. Um, now, um, oh yes, he also said that Government officials should be appointed based on merit, not birth. Now, what you are having, folk, that I don't think we had at the beginning. I mean, okay, let me remind you. At one time, it seemed like all of humanity was very equal, and everybody who was born, who was, born was fairly intelligent. But as time went on, some people, it seems like, dropped out and became less intelligent as time went on. Less than others, pardon me. Less than others. Well, a lot of times, like a general in the army would have a couple of sons, and it was obvious that the oldest one was not fit to be a general, could not serve. So he might then, in that case, appoint a younger son to take his place. Now, the same way with even a, a village leader. A village leader might realize that his oldest son was not good enough or not worthy to be a leader, so he'd appoint another son. This was to lead to the um, civil service exams that the Chinese were famous for inventing. Where you try to determine a person's fitness for a government position based on his test score, high test score. Now I had a pupil ask the time, how do you know that a person with a high test score would make a good government official? Quite frank, you don't, but then again, by what criteria do you decide who's to have the government positions or not? And a person with a very, very low test score would not make a good government official. Um, I mean, folk, in our own country, they tried to sell a sandwich that was a third of a pound to compete with McDonald's quarter pounder. The whole adventure failed because too many Americans don't know that the number one third is a bigger number than one fourth. Yeah, no. I hope that all of you in here know that. But that, you know, they're selling a third of a pound sandwich for the same price as McDonald's quarter pounders. And, and one fourth, that's a bigger number than one third. 